Our study is in the fourth chapter of First Timothy. We started with the first part of this chapter last week, spent uh, most of our time on the first three or four verses, and we're going to overlap some today because we think it is important and uh, go on in the study of this section. I ended last week with comments about some of the people who have written in commentaries and other venues about this particular text. And I noted that the older commentaries of various denominations were very outspoken in their recognition that this was prophecy that Paul gave concerning the great apostasy that would come about in what became the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, briefly outlined as a matter of church history, in the days after the apostles, actually some in that direction before the death of all the apostles, but by the time all the apostles were dead, there were those uh, who had been a part of the church, who continued to be participants with the church, who began to teach things that were contrary to what the apostles taught, and especially uh, developed an ecclesiasticism, a kind of uh, organization by which uh, certain men would assume greater authority in regard to the church and the congregations of the church. And this, as it developed over decade after decade, eventually came to where it was considered that the uh, bishop, the head bishop in the city of Rome, ought to be over all the other bishops and therefore over all the other congregations. Ultimately, this developed to where, after much controversy and, in fact, religious politicking, uh, one was declared to be actually the Pope and the representative of Christ on earth, and that, therefore, he could change things, make rules, teach things that were contrary to the doctrine of Christ. This development in history is foreseen by the Holy Spirit and stated in the words of the Apostle Paul here in what we have as the fourth chapter of 1 Timothy. Paul says that the Spirit declares, and I took note of the fact that all Scripture is declared by the Spirit, but that the Apostle obviously had a special reason for noting that the Spirit spoke this expressly, that there would be at later times, in latter times, meaning in this dispensation, and actually in succeeding generations, those that would depart from the faith. One of the most important things to understand uh, in this section is that the apostle indicates there is an established body of truth a settled faith that should be held to, believed and practiced down through the ages. The Bible speaks of this as the one faith in Ephesians 4 and verse 4. Uh, Paul speaks of the gospel that he preached as being the preaching of the faith. Uh, in, in the book of Jude, in verse 3, there is the admonition to contend for the faith. Uh, in the passage that T.J. read for us from the third chapter of Galatians, which in our usual English translation reads, you're all the children of God by faith, is literally, you're all the children of God by the faith, that is, by the Christian system, because when one is baptized into Christ, he puts on Christ, becomes part of the system. And so there is an established body of truth set forth in the Scriptures. And anything that deviates from that is a departure from 
the faith. It is represented especially in the great apostasy that began uh, in the years following the apostles and developed, as we said, into Romanism. But down through the ages, there have been many other departures from the faith. And even in more modern times, there have been radical departures from New Testament Christianity. Uh, not meaning that people were in the church always and left the church, but the fact of the matter is that there are those who profess Christianity who have developed into various cults and isms that are uh, completely different from what the Bible teaches. We think of the development of Mormonism, which cannot by any stretch of the imagination be called Christianity because it is a complete departure from the faith. And we think of uh, other such systems that have developed and are developing uh, in keeping with the warnings that were given by the Holy Spirit. Now, as we looked at this, uh, we noticed that uh, those who would so depart would be those that would give heed to deceiving spirits, influences that the devil provided we don't know how the devil always provides uh, for deceiving spirits. Uh, we, uh, we recognize that oftentimes it is in the things that are seen, uh, the temptations that come through the flesh. Uh, sometimes it is in, in somehow thoughts being imparted into our minds. The truth of the matter is, we don't know all the ways that the devil, through deceiving spirits, may turn us away from what is right or attempt to turn us away from what is right. Uh, never does the devil have the power to overcome uh, one who is determined to serve righteous, righteously. Now, the Bible says in James chapter 4 that uh, we should flee from the devil. And uh, we turn away from him, he will have no control over us. At the same time, we recognize, as Second Timothy 3 and verse 15 tells us, that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so uh, there's always the threat that we might be taken aside. I mentioned briefly last week that doctrines of demons in the way the wording is, could mean either doctrines about demons or it could be doctrines that come from demons. If it has to do with doctrines about demons, then it has reference to those notions that there are uh, spirits out in the world uh, that are neither God's spirit nor are they human spirits, but that uh, they perhaps are disembodied spirits, the spirits of dead who are operating still in the affairs of the world. And that, of course, is not something that the Bible teaches, but there are those who teach such things. And it's very closely related to the idea that some have that you can pray to saints, and somehow saints, so-called saints, could be intermediaries uh, to carry our prayers to God. But he says they would speak lies and hypocrisy and have their conscience seared with a hot iron. That could either mean that they had become so corrupt that they no longer had any sensitivity about what is right. A conscience that is so seared does not feel any uh, remorse over doing wrong. And there are people who come to that state there are people who practice sin so much, so habitually, so willingly that they cease to have any conscience against sin. At the same time, it might be that the word seared with a hot iron has more reference to being branded or being marked as such a person, that such a person could be identified by the teaching that is false. But now coming on down, we have two specific things that would be characteristic of some who would depart from the faith. He says they would forbid to marry, uh, 
and they would command to abstain from foods. The reference is to those that would claim from a spiritual standpoint that marriage is not a proper thing, that it is something to be avoided for those who could avoid it. And, of course, the doctrine of celibacy is well known in regard to the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they, of course, uh, require that priests be unmarried. And uh, the notion behind that is that a person who is unmarried will be a more spiritual person. And uh, that doctrine, of course, has been held down through the years. They continue to, uh, to, debate, to debate about it, but it is still characteristic of the teaching of the Roman church. And uh, then commanding to abstain from meats or foods, it's not just flesh food, but any kind of foods, uh, has reference to the idea that there must be abstinence from certain things or maybe all foods for certain times uh, as an indication of spirituality. Now let me remind you that Bible teaching is very clear uh, in regard to the matter of marriage. Uh, in Hebrews 13 and verse 4, the very plain statement is made, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So there you have it, that God approves of marriage. But anybody who would think about it a little bit would recognize that is the case. In the very beginning, we find God's approval of marriage, as it recognizes not good for a man to be alone and provided for him a wife. And Jesus, of course, uh, indicated that, <clears throat> that this is a, a principle, a right thing uh, that is held true from the very beginning as he in teaching in the 19th chapter of Matthew says you know from the beginning how that God made them male and female and brought them together and he said what God hath joined together let not man put asunder and uh, very teaching, very plain teaching in regard to that. In Paul's letter in the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 7, uh, there is a discussion concerning things pertaining to marriage. And in the very beginning of that, he says in verse 2, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, that is, because of the temptation of sexual immorality, he says, Let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. And by the way, the next few verses give some very pointed uh, requirements in regard to the marriage relationship. And people that are married, both men and women, ought to consider the apostles' instructions on that point. Now, Paul was not married by his own choice. And he recognized that in some circumstances, one could be a more effective worker for the Lord if he's not married. But never is there any instruction to indicate that one who is in a marriage situation is somehow less prepared to be a servant of the Lord. In fact, the evidence would be that in most cases, a married person can be more effective in regard to many aspects of the work that he is to do. It's rather strange some of the notions that people have developed. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to visit the Shaker Village up in Kentucky. And uh, it's a very interesting place with very interesting woodwork and all of that. But the strange thing about it is the Shakers had decided that marriage was evil and that none of them could be married. And guess what? It wasn't but a few years till there wasn't any more of them. And so uh, that, of course, indicated the folly of such a position as far as it being an ongoing movement. Now, back of this notion of forbidding marriage and commanding to abstain from foods, there is the notion that is, uh, the name that's given to it is asceticism. The notion that one is more spiritual when 
when there is more suffering, more deprivation. And uh, somehow this notion carried over from certain of the Jews' ways of, of thinking and perhaps from even some of the pagans, the notion that for the good of the soul, the body must do without or the body must suffer, that somehow being uncomfortable, physically speaking, makes a person more spiritual. And if you read in church history, you'll find some really astonishing things that went on in centuries past in regard to this. Uh, people who were supposed to be spiritual leaders who would walk barefooted in the winter when clothing, shoes were available, but they would go that way to show that they were spiritual and willing to suffer for God. And uh, there were uh, those that were called the pillar saints who would get on what wouldn't amount to much more than a, a tall column or pole and sit there for days uh, in the attitude of prayer and fasting so that they could show how spiritual they were. Uh, the one case recorded of a man who had himself placed and tied in a position where that if he stretched his legs out to get himself more comfortable, he would go against a sharp rock and cut himself, and so he wouldn't stretch himself out, and he could control himself in this. And you say, well, that's some of the craziest things we've ever heard. But that came from a notion that did develop in the early centuries of asceticism, suffering or deprivation. And uh, Paul dealt with that in the letter to the Colossians. It's a passage you perhaps heard different times, but let me call attention to what he's talking about. Uh, he, he is uh, rebuking some at Colossae in chapter 2, beginning at verse 20. Uh, he says, if you died with Christ uh, and were delivered from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world you're subject yourself to these regulations? The regulations he's talking about, not the gospel regulations. He's talking about regulations that are the doctrines and commandments of men. And in these regulations, they say, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Uh, touch not, taste not, handle not. You've heard the expression. In the context where Paul is giving it, he's talking about those things, uh, those commands that were given by men to claim a spiritual basis when they really were simply ways of making people uncomfortable for no need at all. And so uh, the idea of being miserable does not mean that one is spiritual. And one doesn't have to be a miserable person to be spiritual. Now that comes to us today uh, in, in various ways, sometimes uh, just attitudes that... Uh, people personally develop along those lines, but uh, it's also in uh, uh, the idea of required fasting at certain times. Uh, we have, of course, uh, every year you have people talking about Lent and what, what they're going to do without during Lent, and that that's supposed to be a, a holy 40 days. And, of course, they claim to base that on Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, but there's no scriptural connection to that. And so uh, celibacy and, and pilgrimage and other extremes of depriving self of comfort uh, are not means by which one becomes spiritual. Well, somebody says, well, what about fasting in the Bible? Well, Jesus uh, recognized that there could be voluntary fasting, and he regulated it. In the Sermon on the Mount, he gives regulations for those who would voluntarily fast, but he and his disciples didn't fast. Occasionally, in the New Testament church, uh, there was voluntary fasting, but it was never a commanded thing. It is in order when it is appropriate, but it is not something to be bound on others. And binding such things are a departure from the faith. Now let me just mention that behind this, 
is, is the idea of people making laws that God hasn't made. You, you've heard enough preaching here to know that we believe that every command of God is to be respected. Uh, you know that in churches of Christ, uh, in insisting on following the scriptures, uh, we emphasize <coughs> that what God has placed in his laws are things that are to be respected, and to teach against anything that God requires is grievous sin. To fail to uh, try to live up to what God requires is grievous sin. But it is also sin to make laws where God hasn't made any. And one way that there have been departures from the faith, even that has affected uh, churches of Christ down through the years and even places now, is that people have come up with regulations or laws that they try to bind on the church. And there have been cases of division in the church because of people demanding that their opinions be upheld and followed when there is no scriptural basis for it. And though it seems rather strange to those who may uh, not have known what the background is, it is a fact that some have made laws that said you can't have but one cup in communion. Uh, that is, when you have the Lord's Supper, you, everybody's got to drink out of the same cup or the same glass, or if you've got a big crowd, I guess the same bucket. I don't know how they work that. Uh, they don't have big crowds, of course, when they have that kind of notion. I had an occasion just uh, the last time I was holding a gospel meeting in Charlotte that I preached, I thought, a mighty good sermon one night and had a whole row of people that I didn't know in the audience and they listened well but when they came out I spoke to them and introduced myself and the answer that was given was we only have one cup and I caught on right away to what they were saying so I immediately responded I said that's all we have we have one cup we have a number of containers but we just have one cup we all drink the same thing and they turned and walked away without any further discussion. But it's strange that people make laws uh, that are arbitrary and try to bind them on the church. You've also got those who, who uh, make laws that you can't eat in the church building. And some say uh, that it's wrong to have a fellowship gathering and for brethren to be together and have a meal together and, and have social fellowship and they oppose that and say that if a church practices that they have uh, drifted into sin there's no basis in scripture for that that's making a law where God hasn't made law then there are those who say you can't use the funds of the church, the funds that are contributed into the church treasury, that you can't use it uh, to help those that are in need unless they are members of the church. And such a doctrine has been carried so far as to say it's unlawful to take care of orphans with the church's money and that uh, support of orphan homes is wrong. And there have been those who've stirred up controversy over such foolish positions as that. And all of that is, falls under the same heading as forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Because in every case where people are making laws that God didn't make and pushing things upon the church that God didn't intend to be put upon the church, it is a doctrine that is not from God. And it is, a, it is a departure from the faith. And so these things have to be dealt with. Now notice something that he indicates here as he talks about uh, these things that are forbidden. He says, picking up in verse 3, that these are things which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. People who believe and know the truth are the people who are living the right way and they're pleasing to God. 
and the things that God has created are to be received with thanksgiving. He continues in verse 4 saying, Every creature, and when I read creature, I tend to think of a, an animal, but actually everything that is created is a creature. Human beings are creatures, animals are creatures, and objects are things that God has created. And every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified, that is, it is made right by the word of God and prayer. By the word of God takes you all the way back to Genesis. When God had created the world, he saw it was good. The word of God has declared it to be good. And as far as foods are concerned, we have, of course, from the very beginning that God intended that his creatures his creation provide for food, and to settle the issue of what kinds of meat, the 10th chapter of the book of Acts in the case of Cornelius or Peter being prepared to go to see Cornelius uh, makes it very clear that the laws limiting the Jews to certain kinds of meats no longer apply. And uh, just briefly let me mention that the laws in the Old Testament given to the Jews or to the nation of Israel that forbade their eating certain kinds of animals were laws that were intended to distinguish their lifestyle and their culture from the nations that were around them. It was never that it was sinful for a person to eat shrimp except there was this positive command to keep their diets different from their heathen neighbors so that they would not relax and blend in with the heathen nations that were around them. The same thing in regard to other things. There isn't anything uh, that is inherently sinful about eating pork. It may not be the best thing for some people's health, but is not a question of whether it is in keeping with God's will uh, if it's just a question of what one's personal desire or health might be. So that is a settled thing. But now let me notice something else right quick here. He says that it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. In fact, he has said it's to be received with thanksgiving. Jesus prayed before meals. I'm afraid in our modern culture that we have become so busy that sometimes we rush to the food without thinking about where it came from. It is a temptation when we have busy lives that we don't sit together and pray together before we eat sometimes. I don't know how it is in everybody else's situation, but I know sometimes uh, that is a possibility. And I'm ashamed sometimes when I find that I've started eating a sandwich and I haven't thought about the fact that God gave this to me. And so uh, I think I, I don't hesitate to say that families ought to develop an absolute habit of praying before their meals, individuals as well as entire families. In fact, it would be a wonderful thing, I think, for the American culture if there was more of a return to the dinner table uh, rather than living in the fast pace in regard to our meals that we so often find is the case today. In thinking about this, I thought about the uh, 27th chapter of Acts. It's the most amazing thing while they were in that terrible storm on the sea with 276 people on that little ship and they feared for their life day after day and the storm went on for 14 days in which they did not eat before it finally settled enough that the apostle Paul on board came before all the people and encouraged them that now uh, they ought to take some food 
They had done without. They had been fasting, not as a religious situation. They had been fasting because of the danger uh, they were in, their, their circumstances. And, and so 276 people, along with the Apostle Paul, had gone without eating their meals for 14 days. And then when Paul told them they needed to go ahead and eat the first First of all, before they ate, he gave thanks. They prayed. Some of them were heathen, but Paul prayed in front of them. And uh, he gave thanks before they had the meal. There's a powerful lesson there in regard to this. Now, because of the limits of time, I can't go on to what I uh, had in mind to say about what makes a good minister. But we're studying in First Timothy partly because... We're in the process of, of thinking about who we can get for a new pulpit minister. And um, we just thought this study would be uh, important. So next week, uh, I want to pick up here and read what he says makes a good minister. And that's the kind of minister we want is a good one. We like to close our sermon time. Uh, always with a reminder of the invitation that the Lord has given. And with this good group that's here today, I think there is knowledge of what the gospel plan of salvation is. Uh, and that's what we stand for. That's, that's what we uh, want people to understand that we stand for. And so when the invitation is given, it is to do that which the Lord instructs instructs for a person to do in order to have a right relationship with God. So think about that, and if you need to respond, please come as we stand and sing. <laughs>